I mean, do you have any other heuristics that you think would be useful for aspiring tournament players? Oof, yeah. I mean, um, let's let's stick on ICM. What's up, everybody? Uh, today I've got someone who has won $5.7 million in the last few years and is a bit of a rising star in the poker world and who has abandoned a career in the direction of pro sports for the sake of pro poker. Justin Salibo, what's going on? What's up, man? How are you doing? Um, how do you feel uh, about your future in poker? Yeah, I mean, I'm excited about it. I, uh, I enjoy what I do every day, and, and I like the, the process of everything, and, and by all statistics that I can see, poker is just going to be continue to boom in, in the near future. So, yeah, I'm super, super excited. What makes you say that? I mean, just like tournament fields are huge. Um, action just getting more accessible and bigger. Uh, different venues are running higher stake tournaments. And you see things like whatever, the Triton 100K and stuff just get record numbers and all, all over the world. So I, I, uh, it doesn't seem to be slowing down anytime soon. Oh, that's quite promising. But what other um, what other avenues are open up? Or are you talking about more so just like venues? You know, you get twenty five k's in Southern Florida. All the EPT twenty five k's are huge. Uh, Aria mm-hmm. Poker Go is running amazing tournaments. The series has great tournaments. So uh, I just think like if you're a live tournament player right now, it's it's not so it's not difficult to get buy ins in. It's it's much more difficult to try to manage your time and and like take time off or skip events or things like that because like, there's just something going on constantly. It feels like. Oh, okay. Um, and uh, would you say that people are playing Is it? Would you say there's lots of value? Uh, I can't really speak to that. You know, I've, I've only been playing live tournaments since, since really 2021. Um, I, I've never been a guy to, like, focus too much on the value of things and try to figure out if I'm winning the 6% or the 8% or 9% or whatever it might be, you know. So uh, you that's for other people to try to dissect and figure out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Real. <laughs> Super numbers. Well, these are um, a bit important questions. Uh, I do want to get into what made you decide to shift from uh, from being a goalie. I understand, and you also had a bit of a career in golf. Is that right? No, no. I wish. Oh, I, I, I just mis- picked I up golf that. recently. More of a oh, okay, more of a okay. <laughs> My bad. Okay. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, the quality of the games is something really that I think is an underrated aspect of how to actually make money in poker. Uh, that people don't really talk so much about in comparison to the overwhelming amount of information directed towards actual strategy, which I think is funny and requires like a bigger discussion in general. But it's like, you know, if there's many spots opening up on the whole, certainly if things can't be gloom and doom, but you have to find really where the best spots are at. Uh, but it sounds like you're touring mostly, playing mostly American ones, right? I, I play a lot of the EPTs too. I try to get at least a a couple EPTs in a year, and then is at least two okay. or three Tritons a year, hopefully. Okay, well, I can say, um, before we move on to more about you and your life, I can say there's lots of stuff opening up in Asia. Uh, as someone who's been, like, hopping around through Asian countries, there's a, the tournament series in Cambodia opening up that sounds like a high roller and probably quite promising. Uh, JG is getting record numbers and Triton, and uh, there's some stuff going on in Australia, too, so that's cool. It looks like, yeah, yeah like sure. you said, things are booming. In right, right before way. Jeju, right before Jeju, they just had the APT in uh, Taiwan. So I, I went to Paris and played the EPT, and then hopped over to Taiwan, and they ran like a twenty-five k, a couple ten k's, and some three, four, five k type stuff. And I mean, it's like everything over there seems to just be kind of booming, and and they love poker oh, yeah. over there, and and people are starting to travel. So I, I wish I would have stayed after. Honestly, I, I have a lot of guys that are in uh, in Vietnam now after the Jeju Triton series, and then back in Jeju for APT. It's like non-stop action over there which, which is pretty cool to see what's in vietnam a, a, a uh, another apt or what i think it's like a usop uh, i'm not quite sure the brand um that, that's running them but but yeah just some like 10ks in da nang i think and some oh, obviously okay. smaller stuff too but yeah da nang is uh where where there's some stuff going on um i knew that there's some stuff going on da nang i know a little bit about that. Uh, I would think it'd be might w- maybe worth checking out these other countries too, but I will be reporting on that myself. 
Yeah. I want to ask why uh, you decided to switch between your career as a goalie. Um, is that your your main passion that you switched from to poker? Yeah. So I mean, uh, it, I would say it wasn't so much of a choice, honestly. Like after I finished my college career, I didn't get drafted into the into the MLS, and and it was kind of like the the breaking point for me. It was like I I could have gone and played like minor league and tried to grind my way up, but um, but it definitely wasn't as minor league soccer is not like the biggest thing in America, right? So I think at that point, I definitely had like some sort of identity crisis where I'd just been a soccer player or a student athlete for my entire life, or at least my entire like adult life. Um, and, and I really didn't know what I wanted to do. And I was playing a lot of poker. I I'd graduated college in engineering. And I, I honestly, I was just like super lost, uh, super lost in, on what I wanted to do. And, and it ended up, I ended up just getting super lucky that uh, I met some, met some really good people and, and um, just kind of like funneled that uh, kind of emptiness almost or like identity crisis into just like into poker and into learning the game and playing as much as I could and I think that like in that time that was like huge for me to to really kind of uh, uh kind of start making my way in poker and then once I saw that it, it, it could work out as a profession I think I I just dove in kind of head first yeah I mean that's one thing I constantly advocate uh is that poker has a much more it, the pathway to success is much more accessible in comparison to pro sports and other things where it's like very tough unless you're very very good uh, for sure for sure even other thing. professions right like like my older brother is a, is a doctor in in ohio and i watched him like doctor. go to four years of undergrad four years of medical school a bunch of years of residency maybe a little bit of a fellowship and it's like he doesn't become a doctor until he's like in his 30s you know in poker like you really can if you like dedicate I don't know, three to six years of your life. Like if you just like really, really go after it, you can kind of, you can kind of like make headway in, in, in the industry much quicker than, than, than other industries, I think. Well, that's quite promising. I would hope that, I mean, in other cases, it, they were saying that it would, shouldn't take three years, I would think, but I, I, I mean, maybe that's the par, I don't know, or maybe that's a good run or bad run, or I don't know, maybe the other people were lucky, excuse me. Sure. I don't. I don't know. It really is realistic, but it's something worth investigating uh, without dedicating all my time to figuring out uh, <laughs> experientially. And uh, but yeah, it's uh, promising for poker that it's working out so well. Um, I'm curious. Uh, I I heard from your other podcast. Why Why does everyone love working with you? Uh, <laughs> I, I'm not sure about that. I. Uh... I, I think that I like to I like to collaborate with people and and I, I like to build things uh, honestly I think that my brain still misses that part of of normalcy a little bit that the poker doesn't provide in terms of in terms of like um, you, you know like where you put ten hours in and you get ten hours out kind of thing right there, it's not as, as straight of a path and so yeah I, I like to I like to build structure and, and like have things that I'm working towards. So it ends up leading to like a lot of collaborations and, and I've worked with so many like great people and, and gotten to learn from so many great people in the industry that, that, that I feel like, um, it, it works out somewhat naturally. Um, you mean in poker, right? So you have been, uh, that was actually one of my next questions was, are there any out? Well, the, the next question was like, have you found people to work with in poker to build collaboratively with, because it's possible, even though it's a less than zero sum game, when you look at it from the perspective of money, or have you found other outlets uh, to yeah. apply that tendency? Yeah, so actually, it, it, it's um, it, it started early on because in college I actually got an internship with John Little in PokerCoaching.com, and so it, it was actually quite mm -hmm. funny that um, I was just like a student learning poker and and like oh. in studies and in, and in soccer and whatnot, and I kind of reached out to him. I'd read a couple of his books and I tried to like just take in as much free content as I could. Um, and so he, he really like helped me a lot and kind of led me in, in good directions in terms of uh, how to approach the game. He helped me, uh, he coached me for, for years and then he actually gave me coaching from other people uh, as I was getting better and better. And so I, I, I still work with, with John in the poker coaching kind of community, uh, building courses, building content, things like that, uh, working on different projects. So I, I, I love the data side of things. I think that um, I prefer the data side of things much more than than like creation of things like on video or or, or whatnot. But um, mm -hmm. but yeah, that's been that, that's been a, a great uh, kind of collaborative work th throughout my poker career. That's 
that's allowed me to, you know, finish a trip and, and go work a few days on some project and, and things like that. So what did the, um, the internship look like? Because I've never heard of an actual poker internship, but I did have this idea myself because I, it, it occurred to me that, and I do want to have this put out publicly because it will be good for the poker economy, but basically if people can create normal jobs within poker, like official jobs essentially and create a jobs market, it just certainly helps supplant a lot of the, uh, it helps a lot of people raise up, in, raise up in stakes and get like some kind of living. And this can be like a global market of sorts. I don't see why not. I mean, poker exists on the global market, not in the local market, which is very important for yeah. developing countries. Um, so uh, did you do anything for him? Like, did you need any money? How did this result in getting money? Yeah, so so I had I had no money at the time, pretty much, right? I'd, I'd worked some college jobs that was were paying I don't even remember maybe twelve bucks an hour or something, and in, in like an engineering kind of role, um, and I'd reach out to Jonathan because I was playing a ton online, trying to like figure out how to play the game, and I'd read his books and and uh, and whatnot, and so the the way that it essentially worked is he gave me his private coaching price, and I don't remember what it was, maybe it was like four hundred an hour or something like that, and I, and I could certainly not afford. Uh, I was playing 25 yeah, and out at the time. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't just do that, right? So um, my response to it was like, hey, like, I've read all your books. I'm reading all this stuff. Is there anything I can help you with like, that I could give you value and that I could get coaching on the side? So the internship actually was that for every 10 hours of work I did for him, he would give me an hour of coaching. Um, and the work I would do for all him right. is he, he pretty much just gave me these projects that I would go through every single piece of content he made and just start like, like writing down notes and taking notes and things that could help him build frameworks for how he wanted to teach poker. Um, as well as like, it, it could be used on social media and different graphics and YouTube and, and things like that. So, um, so like the last year of college, I would just work, I don't know, maybe 10 hours a month and get one session a month, uh, from him. And, and then I was playing at yeah, 25 and L and trying to move up in, in six max cash games. And that was kind of like the deal that we had back in, uh, back in 2017. And, and without that, I don't think I could have ever, uh, really made it in the industry. Kind of like what you're saying, a lot of, uh, even a lot of my time in the last uh, five, six years, if, if I didn't have uh, kind of extra supplemental income or extra projects, things like that, I wouldn't have been able to like take the shots and, and the risk that, that I was able to take, uh, which was huge because my income wasn't solely poker, right? It wasn't just playing tournaments because if I was in, if I was a full-time, if I didn't have other income, I don't think I would mm -hmm. be playing live tournaments uh, today because there's just a lot easier ways with less variance, like make a good salary and a lot of money um, in poker. And it's not going to play the toughest tournaments in the world, right? And so I think that having the supplemental income gave me the opportunity to really take a shot at like trying to like get to the top of, of the kind of like tournaments and, and still pushing in that, in that direction. Wait, so what's your supplemental income um, that you're referring to? The well, coaching well, now I just, what? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I build courses for poker coaching, um, just like coaching income. So I build courses for them. I manage the coaches and different projects that, that we work on. I, I build all the background data for, for his content now. And so like he'll he'll reach out and just be like, hey, I want you know a database of SIMs around this stuff. And so I'll just go build 100 ICM scenarios and then he can take it and create content with it. Because he doesn't want to sit there and build, um, build all the data. So I handle all the data stuff and then he handles uh, kind of all the coaching and, and all that kind of, uh, all the teaching. Oh, really? Okay, so the data would just be various different ICM situations. Yeah, or just chip EV stuff, right? Like say, he, like for he built a big one called the Tournament Masterclass and the Cash Game Masterclass, and each of them just needed a ton of sims and a ton of data to be like really well organized, such that he could go teach how to play all the different board types and things like that. And, and so I would just be the kind of guy behind the scenes, uh, running all the data, talking to him about strategies, talking to him about you know my thoughts on on how he should play certain spots. And then he would kind of take all of that, compile it into a course, and then and then go ahead and teach it. Well, that sounds like a pretty sophisticated effort, actually. Um, I'm I'm a bit curious of the process of how you learned how to do all that. To be honest, maybe it was him that created this crazy course. Oh, yeah, or so created it's, this method of, huh? Yeah, I mean, it actually worked just supernaturally. So, I would say about a year after we kind of had this arrangement, um, I was studying a lot and I was playing a lot. And there became a point where uh, he felt that it was the right thing to like set me up with coaching with other people uh, to kind of like keep pushing me and up stakes and all that stuff. 
And so he actually uh, gave me, I forget how many hours, like eight or 10 hours of coaching with a guy, Michael Acevedo, to learn how to use Munker Solver really well and to learn how to use Pile Solver really well. Uh, I started with like Card Runners EV and then I got into like Pile Solver and Munker and he pretty much just gave me a ton of coaching from uh, experts in the data on on how to like optimally use some of those programs and like how to test things, how to run g- good data and whatnot. And then from that, he wanted data, right? So I became like kind of the guy that would just build him sims for his own studies and, and, and build different uh, build different databases for him to study from. And then he started using that in his uh, kind of in his coaching. And, and then so it worked out like quite organically and, and quite naturally with that stuff. Okay, cool. Um, all right. Well, it sounds like a really legit effort and like one way for you to make additional money that's not like swinging all over the place with these these tournaments. This seems like another avenue of sorts towards poker success that doesn't require supplementing it with cash games or starting your own business or whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, I want to ask... I'm personally curious, how do you find managing multiple coaches? Uh, was this like a natural progression for you? Because this seems like a different skill set. Or, like, it's one thing to be a coach. It's one thing to build the sims and all of that, create it and uh, present it nicely. But then to manage the coaches, I mean, I think you'd have to teach them individually and maybe collectively. Yeah, so um, I would say, again, like, it kind of just worked out somewhat naturally in the sense that. Uh, poker coaching was growing. It started with uh, with maybe four coaches who were great coaches, but he wanted to kind of add add in more people. And at this point, in like 2021, I was talking poker with some really strong players and and um, and ha- had a, had a good network in, in the industry. So uh, a lot of the coaches that I would say like have built courses and and I've like managed in some ways are, are just kind of like friends and 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 people I've talked poker with. So it's it's been it's been much easier like. You know, we we would build a heads up course with John Jaffe, and we would just like play heads up and chat and like build curriculums and things like that. So um, it, it was really just like talking poker with friends almost. Like, like it was set up in such an easy way for me to uh, to, to kind of help them, and it, it it was just a lot of win wins. You know, as coaches that that wanted to build content and have some supplemental coaching income, and then from our side of poker coaching, it was it was great to get some bigger names and some some really strong players uh, creating content. Oh, okay. Do you want to mention what kind of players are uh, making content? Yeah, so we have uh, we have John Jaffe, um, Chris Brewer, Brock Wilson, Adam Hendricks does PLO. Um, I, I mean, there's so many I'm missing. We have a, a Spin and Go guy, uh, Lexi Gavin, Evan Jarvis, Alex Fitzgerald. So some of those, uh, some of those like big field players. Um, I know I'm missing some, but but yeah, those are those are some of the ones I've, I've worked closely with in, in the past year or two. Okay, cool, cool. Um, yeah, those are some uh, big names. Um, I'm curious, is there anything in your approach that uh, you think is unique in comparison to other people's approaches? Hmm, yeah, that's a good question. I think that um, I would say one of the most unique things in the way that I approach uh, the game now is I think that I made so many mistakes early on in terms of, in terms of solving data and trying to build my strategies I think I was trying to be so precise uh, with combos and so precise with with strategies, and I think that where I'm a little bit more unique now, and I think that's really helped me in in live tournaments and, and in tournaments in general, is that uh, I'm much more concerned about global frequencies, and and I'm much much happier to kind of like build my own data in a more unique way than than some other other players. Like I think that a lot of players can can look at public databases and things like that, and just use like three sizes on the flop and, and four on the turn and four on the river, things like that, where I'm much more interested in, in uh, trying to be unique strategically in, in the way I approach things and the sizes I use. Um, and I'm much, and I try to be really focused on my global frequencies and, and not my combos because I think early you, on, yeah, go ahead. You mean your global frequencies is in how frequently you bet and that kind of thing, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Oh. I think that early on I was, I was, especially when I started playing live, I was a little bit too happy to be there. You know, I was a little bit too happy to like be playing medium and high stakes. Um, I, f- I kind of think that I had an insecurity that, that caused me to want to show people that I was good. You know, want to show people that I had studied, that I could, I can bet 10 on the river. And when I get raised, I jam on you with the combo that can jam. Right. But, but <laughs> what I was finding is that like, 
my overall frequencies were just were just not accurate. They, they weren't even close, right? I would see a combo that could three bet the big blind pre at 20% frequency, and I would just do it every time, right? I would find a river spot where like in position, you have to give up with bluffs. Like there's so many spots where like you just check lose, right? I mean, you, you can't just always bluff uh, a hand that's not going to win a showdown. But I would be like, oh, well, this combo can bluff, right? And then I would always bluff it. So I think that, that I think I just lost so much live in my first year that I really had to kind of rethink my approach and, and try to be uh, more precise in, in my overall frequencies and care a lot less about what combos I used or being so precise in my, in my king of hearts six rather than king of spades six of hearts, right? It's like that stuff to me doesn't matter at all anymore. And I still think that a lot of guys, even in the high stakes, are, are a little bit obsessed with combos. Um, and so I think that's probably where I'm a little bit more unique. Okay, that is kind of interesting. I, I, that sounds like a very hard thing to do, especially when, you know, the frequencies are like 57% or, you know what I mean? Or uh, are you ballparking? How are you doing this? Yeah, I, this I would say, a, yeah, so frequency may, might not be the right word. It's more about ratios, right? Like, I think that I was sitting at my computer a couple years ago and like, obviously, you know, you don't know this, but people, maybe people in the audience won't. It's like, if you have a bluff catcher on the river, Mm-hmm. And they are bluffing 3% less than they should in a solver. Like, how much less often should we call? Well, we should literally never call, right? It's like when someone's frequencies are off by 5%, we don't adjust by by matching their how, how much they're off by and just be like, oh, well, now I'm going to call 5% less than my bluff catchers. It's like, no, it's so sensitive, right? If they're bluffing 5% too much, your bluff catchers are all worth EV now. And if they're bluffing 5% too little... Now you need to fold everything. So it's it's huge adjustments from tiny from tiny differences in that. So I think that the way I approach it in game is like all in my ratios. I just try to like count my combos now, focus on my value threshold, focus on my uh, how many combos I have of value, and then what types of hands I have to bluff. And, and my rule of thumb is that if I look at a combo and think I should bluff it every time, bluff it 30% of the time, and, and I'll control my frequencies much better. Oh, okay, okay. Um, I mean, this sounds like something doable. I still would imagine it to be incredibly complicated in practice, especially when you start like getting into the ICM possibilities. Like I looked at a few myself. Uh, I have not been focusing on tournaments because I've got a bazillion things to do. Uh, and like ICM was not simple. It was like, there was some stuff going on when I looked at some post flop situations and it was like, holy shit. Now the strategy is wildly different. In some of these spots, there'd be like an overbet jam for 2x pot with like a few combos and then like hands that were like uh, not that too intuitive to check back would be checked back and this would depend on if you're, you know, if you're, you are you have a vulnerable situation or, or, or whatever. I, I'm really curious how you do this, particularly when, you know, it's like a final table or um, anything else. Is there any kind of method to adjusting according to ICM? I mean, you you have to work really, really hard, right? I mean, I, I think that, um, I think I kind of had the realization when I started first playing like really big, um, I had a really good end of 2022, start of 2023, and I started playing playing bigger. And I think the ICM is such such a cool topic of poker. And I one thing that I think is a little bit lost about the high stakes guys, and like in general, the high stakes, is it's so common for you to, for, for me to hear people to talk about like, oh, well, like, they're all just kind of playing, like, GTO, or they're all just, like, playing pretty fundamentally sound. Like, where are the edges or where... It's like, no. In ICM especially, if you watch these final tables, there are so many different styles. There's so many different ways that these guys are trying to play uh, and, and approach ICM. There's some people that, you know, value future game, like, so much, and they take on so much variance with 12 left because if they can get the chip lead, they think they're going to win the tournament every time. There's others that are just, like, try to be by the book, you know, study as much as they can of of HRC and Pio post flop and, and Munker and stuff and, and just try to be as good as possible. It's like, there's so many different ways to approach ICM and styles. Um, I would say for me personally, I, I don't know. I don't know if I have a style. I don't know if I have a style or, or a real approach to ICM. It's such a hard game. I try to like make it, uh, executable for myself. I don't use too many sizes post. I don't use, uh, I, I use a lot of sizes preflop sometimes. Like you, you can mess with all sorts of three bet sizes and four bet sizes uh, and solvers. But it, as long as you kind of understand the fundamentals of what's happening in ICM and the hand types to grab from, I, I think it's much easier to 
to try to like solve it in game, right? And, and like try to figure out the, the kind of exact situation. Right. Um, well, you know, as someone who has a lot of complicated, uh, very complicated schedule, I would be, have to look at heuristics and just find like a bunch of heuristics essentially uh, to, yeah, you basically described this in a way. You said like, okay, well, you just classify things as hand type. I personally found, at least when I checked the EVs of different bed sizes, that they didn't matter necessarily that much. Although um, there were, I, I, I mean, I, I personally had a bit of a different approach. Uh, I mean, all that makes quite some sense to me. I would think that definitely there is quite a lot of value from what I've seen. It seemed like many options that even were GTO were not really explored. Um, like particularly when things got a bit more on the extreme end. Uh, or obtuse end, I should say, those two po those two realms, which isn't a surprise. I want to ask, um, well, for one, do you agree with uh, my observations about people haven't really explored much of the extreme end or, or like the unusual end of things? Or like, would I mean, it's even, like, it's a hard thing to really even get a sample on. I'm just curious, I'm curious about that. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, I'm not sure. I would say that I think that the exploration of, of ICM has so many different variables and components that it just is impossible to like truly explore with the current softwares and, and things that we have today. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, I think that without, like with the current solvers and, and the current like methods that we, that we have, I think that people are probably exploring a lot of the fringe stuff. Um, but they, but there's limitations in the exploration, right? And so, like, the fact that you can't really run for the future game of the end of the tournament, right? You can look at two, like, like when you're running a solver or whatever, it's like, if you run something for, like, three future games, and the third future game, you end up under the gun, all of a sudden the solve isn't accounting for the fact that you're going to have to pay the big blind and the big blind any the next hand. And then what's going to happen in the small blind, right? And so, like, there's there's so many factors and variables that... That it, I think it's just impossible to explore all of all the possibilities that, you, that you're kind of referring to. Can you give another example of that where um, it's not dependent on something like the big blind and the small blind, or not so future game dependent, or is it is future game really the big uh, a big factor in making these as a sub question or side question is future game really important in, in the determination of making these situations like super complicated. Okay, so I'll say um, I'll say the answer to your second question is is yes. It, I think that future game is is extremely important into like figuring out how to play a lot of these spots. Um, but for your first question, there's a lot of complexity in just the ICM model, right? Like one one um, example that I kind of like to go back to in my mind, and it just makes sense. Like every, everybody understands that like the least chips you have, the more each chip is worth. Right, but but they don't really think about the fact that 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 all that's also true when you're taking chips from people, right? If if somebody has fourteen bigs and you have twenty in the big blind and they jam your for their fourteen bigs, you're gonna call much wider than if you're fourteen bigs in the big blind and a fifty big blind stock or a forty big blind stock in the small blind jams. Even though the jam is wider in the small blind because they have more chips, winning the chips from that player is worth so much less. And so even in the, like, it's just so, uh, it's so variable in the ICM model because where you're grabbing chips from makes a difference. Whereas if you're just doing chips, calling a 14 big blind jam in the big blind is, is what it is. It doesn't matter who's the effective stack. It doesn't matter like anything else. It's just like, I'm calling a 14 big blind jam. Here's the Nash equilibrium. I'm going to call with those hands as, as long as they're a good player. But uh, in the ICM thought, model, yeah. go ahead. Uh, why don't you go finish your thought first? Well, I was going to say, but in the ICM model, like who you're taking chips from matters um, because the value of the chips is worth more. And, and so, so your ICM value is going to just go up higher in the tournament when you're taking chips from an effective stack that's, that's lower. And so all of a sudden calling ranges are variable, not on the effective stack, but on the stack distribution as well, which that's makes it really complicated. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, I actually did think about that for quite a while. Um, I mean, I never did any work on it. Uh, I would presume, are there not like a bunch of heuristics based off of that? Like if I would think you could create a bunch of 
you know, uh, a c bunch of situations that account for 80 plus percent of the situations you're going to come into and around that, uh, you know, subset of, of difficulty and then just look at the approximations of whatever the best model sim there is and then get some compelling answers. Uh, is that accurate? You have to do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That, in, in my opinion, that's, that's kind of what you have to do. You, you can't just take it all like it's a unique spot. Like if you just have a simple heuristic that like one of, and I assume heuristic that I, that I love is like the most important players behind are the big blind and the button. And so like to, when, you're defi when you're just trying to decide how wide you need to RFI, really the stacks that matter are big blind and button. It's like sure the cutoff and the small blind matter, but the, most, the, the two stacks that are gonna VPIP the most are by far the most important in terms of your frequency and size preflop. Um, and then the heuristic for this kind of spot is like, all right, well, if you're taking, if a, a shorter effective stack jams, you need to call pip wider than if the guy's, than if the guy's uh, you know, covering you for the same range. So you just have to call wider in the spots. Well, what does wider mean? I mean, that can mean a lot of things. Sure, sure. I, I mean, but like the, if the heuristic is like whatever you think the range is out of pip, that's kind of how I try to think about it in game. Okay. I mean, do you have any other heuristics that you think would be useful for aspiring tournament players? Oof, yeah. I mean, um, let's let's stick on ICM. I'll say that I'll say that in general, let's let's do a future game heuristic because I think that that's something that um, I think that that's something that people maybe don't think about as enough, especially in some of the mid stakes. Like, uh, if if you're a medium stack and you're looking at taking on variance, always think about um, what the likelihood of you becoming the big stack is. And when it's high, be willing to take on more variance. I, I kind of had this spot actually in, in this recent 100K in Jeju where uh, it folded to me in the small blind and I had 25 bigs and the big blind had like 17 or so. And at my table were 12 left in the 100K and at my table, nobody has a big stack. And so in this spot, when it folds to me in the small blind, I'm going to be so aggressive. Because if I can go from 25 to 30 bigs in an orbit, my EV in the tournament is exponentially higher. Whereas if there's a 50 big blind stack, two to my left, I have to be way tighter. And so I would say that the heuristic in that kind of that, that I would say for a future game is like, if you can become the big stack, be willing to take on more risk, um, kind of in that two tables left uh, format. Okay. Um... Well, how much higher would you say that it gets in that kind of situation? Uh, wasn't it? It wasn't it a high roller. So it's you said it's twelve left. Um, I would think that you don't have such an empowering edge in a high roller. I think with twelve left, but if it's like you know there's a thousand people or something, um, it's twelve left. Okay, uh, but I don't know. I don't know actually. So uh, what kind of what kind of big difference do you think it makes to have that? advantage i think that it's probably in the in the units of like hundreds of thousands of dollars or like like multiple buy-ins like i think oh, really? that yeah like i i think that it's and once again we don't have software for this we don't we don't have data you know it's it's more of an in, intuition game and like trying to model out f outcomes and, and frequencies but but i think that watching some of the best players play in the world that, that I look up to and seeing kind of the risks they take and knowing that how strong of players they are and how well studied they are. Um, it, it feels to me that like in that small blind spot, maybe I'm jamming 70% of hands for 17 bigs when I can become the chip leader in a few hands. Whereas if there's a 60 big blind stack, two to my left, maybe I'm jamming 20% less or 25% less. Like I think that it's, I think that it can be a huge, uh, a huge difference and, and it's not so much edge of me over my opponents. It's just the edge of what my stack is, is going to allow me to do. Right, right. I see. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. So you might want to do it more than, like, if there's a couple, multiple short stacks, right? And you can, and there's no, and there's a bunch of medium stacks. Uh, and, and then you can get, like, a, I don't know, like a, like a, a 1.5, uh, time 1.5x uh, size advantage on all the medium stacks like maybe that kind of situation you'd be you know you'd go like quite a bit wider like five percent wider or whatever yeah yeah i mean the but your, your button ev in the next hand 
by you having whatever two big blinds more two and a half big blinds more it, it's probably the difference of like i don't know i would be guessing to, to say but I, I would be willing to wager it's like maybe four bb per hundred or something like that just by having three big blinds more on the button the very next hand Right, just because you're just gonna be, you're able to VPIP so much wider, you're limiting the cutoff and the hijacks RFIs just by having this like slightly bigger stack. Um, and so yeah, I mean, if if you can just like, I would say for the mid stakes too. One interesting thing about about this is like, it's all about what happens in real life. It's not about how how things work in, in solvers or in data, right? And there's a number of times where I, I've been coaching somebody to mid stakes final table or or like two tables left or, or whatever, and when the big stack isn't a strong player, all of a sudden the future game becomes way more important, right? Because like in real life, if they're not V-pipping enough, if they're not RFIing enough, if they're not doing all those things, there's this extra EV to grab by getting a bigger stack. So it's kind of, it's kind of the same thing um, outside of data, just like in real life. It's it's like if if I can win this all in and all of a sudden I'm going to take over the tournament and just like be able to RFI a ton and V-pip a ton because this other big stack will not fight back, well, it's worth way more than if the guy's a really good player and he's going to like not let me just like raise the button 75% of the time or something like that. Uh, okay. Yeah. I mean, this is, these are some definitely uh, interesting things to think about. Uh, what kind of data would you say that you're able to extrapolate, if any, uh, that allows you to figure out like extra exploitative advantages at the poker table um, have you been able to uh, find any data-driven advantages? Um, it's it's something that I'm not super super versed in. I would say I, I've spoken with a lot of players that are much more into the mass data analysis. Uh, you know, they they'll take in millions of hands from online play and try to adjust their strategy type thing. Um, it's not something that that I would say I'm an expert in, like using the hand and HUD and all that stuff. But but from them, I've certainly learned some. Uh, uh, so, some exploits to use and, and some things in terms of like population tendency. And, and once you kind of learn the rules, almost, it's, it's kind of like you're saying, like heuristics, right? In, in PLO cash games, people overfold to river probes. Like people, you can look at millions of hands of data online or whatever. It's like, if it goes check, check on the turn and you block the river small in PLO, it generates an overfold, at least across all the data that, that, that I've been able to see. And so it's like, all right, well, if you know that, like you can kind of just like maybe bluff a little bit more in, in, in that node and, and probably value bet less in that node because you're not getting, like, people aren't fighting back hard enough, right? So you can, like, learn little heuristics from that stuff too. But I would say I'm not not an expert in uh, in finding those heuristics from data. Uh, okay, okay. That's kind of my thing based on the intuition. Uh, my I would say that my approach is kind of just, like, try everything and see what works and what doesn't. I mean, I didn't try everything. There's ones that these guys taught me too. I do think the mass data stuff is, is quite a lot of potential. Um also I was thinking scary. that, huh? Also very scary, right? Uh, I don't think it's so scary to be honest. Like if you just like know what they're someone's doing, you just adjust to them. If you can well, sorry, see, sorry. I, as a player, for sure. I mean, more so like I've definitely been scared to like just go play the high stakes online with a name that people know me, and and all of a sudden like they're compiling all my data, and they're able to kind of be like, oh well, this is how he's playing these spots and, and whatever. So. Well, the I capability mean, is scary. Yeah, I guess if someone was it to, to, I don't know if this exists where someone can just like set up a system where they download all your hands somehow that are available on all sites and then say, okay, these are the exploits. I've never heard of that, but that, I guess that's the thing. That would be pretty scary if someone had that possibility, but that's not what mass data analysis really does. It just looks at population tendencies. Yeah, yeah, I mostly agree. I, I, I don't know enough about it. I've definitely seen some some things in the recent past that are player specific, data driven things, um, mm -hmm. and, and and yeah, that's that's definitely that's definitely given me some some uh, some some fear some fear of playing playing big and, and, and putting a lot of volume in. Yeah, yeah. Well, if it gets to that, you know, this is where you have to look for another game. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. Well, just another game in poker. Like you don't have to sure. leave poker because there's some fucking genius has this program. <laughs> it's the, in my experience, I don't know. I've just seen so much not genius stuff that not too worried about it. But 
Uh, cash games, the cash game guys online, some of them are really, really sophisticated. I mean, they have to be. Uh, the effort, the effort scares me, but there's ways of jumbling it real easily. Um, I want to ask, uh, what other sorts of deviations from GTO that you tend to make without telling too much about your like specific tendencies? Uh, um, just like the theme of how they look, is it more like in the direction of, is it more in the ICM, uh, ICM basis, or is there any fu other future game stuff that is important for most tournament players? Um, there cer there certainly are. I would say that most of the deviations I'm I'm making are just chips based. I would say like, I mean, in small field high rollers, obviously you're playing like with ICM in mind uh, much more frequently, but, but I'm still like focused on playing all the best 5Ks and 10Ks I can that are, that are more big field stuff. And I think that those are kind of the, the fields and the spots where, where deviations come, come more naturally. Um, I would say that one of the things that I probably do uh, quite often and, and more than most is like splitting my sizes. You know, I think that there's a lot of spots where like an overbet on the turn, I just think gets maybe overfolded uh, quite often. And if you look at a computer, there's so many spots where a computer wants you to 2.5x the turn and then 2.5x the river. And, and all the young GTO guys that grew up with with pre-solved databases where they didn't have to like build it and work for it or, or things, uh, you know, they they want to be fancy and show that stuff. And so I think that's that's probably my biggest de like some of my biggest deviations just come from I, I'm going to just size down my value against a lot of players in, in those spots. I I know that it generates a massive overfold. So like. I'm just going to bet more frequently, push more equity, and, and use smaller sizes with my value. And then maybe I just find the 2.5x pot with like a few, like a number of my bluff combos, and I'm just never going to bluff the river because I think it gets an, a massive overfold, and then they just show up to the river way too strong. Yeah, sure. That makes quite some sense. I, I actually did kind of come to a similar conclusion with the 2.5x on the turn. I mean, part of the issue, even of using that size on the turn, would be that you can use a smaller size and just bluff them on the river, or you can overbet them on the river, or whatever. Even if you're like trying to bluff, um, like that would be better situation than two point five x and get the overfold on the on the river, and that way you're balanced anyway. Um, sure. Yeah, and, uh, you I get the EV. Up, uh, yeah, one one example of this that that opened my mind was I played with John Jaffe. I don't know if you played with him much. He's like a old school heads up, sit and go guy. He plays all the high six tournaments now. Like great guy, like great player, all that stuff. We, we were playing heads up and then we were, we were like very friendly and, and chatting about the strategies and stuff. And we probably played, I don't remember, maybe eight hours of like big blind Annie heads up and then eight hours of, of like cash game heads up. And at the time I was playing a lot of flop over bets in cash, like deep stack cash heads up. Um, and I wasn't really realizing that he was just kind of murdering me in those nodes because I'm pretty sure that what was happening was he was just like kind of under the assumption that I wasn't, it's so easy on like an ace king seven to just look at your best combos and be like, oh, I'm supposed to 1.25 X pot. Like, let me just, let me overbet the flop. And it's really hard to take all of the frequencies of your lower equity hands and find the right mixes. And so he was actually just like folding really big hands right away to me. And, and I think that after I like was testing some stuff, I was just probably value heavy when I was using the overbet size um, in that spot. So I think that that was an adjustment I made. And just in terms of like the way I built my strategy was that I'm not going to take all these fancy sizes that I'm having a hard time uh, hitting the frequencies of. I'd rather just like simplify my flop size, play like a bet 80, play a bet 85% pot and just like and just have an easier time building my strategies. Yeah, it makes lots of sense. Um, I I actually do something similar, but I base it more on uh, I base it on a few things. Um, I mean, I I use kind of an improvis improvisational approach, and a lot of like population tendencies that I uh, like relative population tendencies of the fields that we play, and also um, a big thing is I check the EV and the solver of the different lines. Like if there's not much EV from the overbet flop. Uh, thing, then I, if I think they're gonna make the adjustments that, if I think their counter strategy is gonna be like pretty likely to happen, 
then I won't bother with the strategy. Um, nice. But uh, I prefer to pick things where people's counter strategies are a little bit more difficult to actually put in play. Absolutely, and and, and the way I, I, another t- to add on to that in terms of in terms of what I want to do in game and what I want to do in in my study time is like like I, you constantly want to bring people to where they're not comfortable. So I would say that I actually play a lot more passively on flops with different sizes than other people. Some people are just like, oh, let me find the the biggest size I can see bet my entire range for because then I'm not making any mistakes. And I'm like, well, why would I do that? It's, they've seen, like most high stakes guys have seen that a million times the last five years. I'd way rather just be like, all right, I'm going to play a bet 65 here, bet 80, and I'm going to just check 40% of my range. And they haven't played the check check in this spot nearly as often as they've seen the c-bet for the small size so yeah i'm mm-hmm. constantly focused on that as well and in, in terms of like just just trying to uh you know you know what's a funny example is in the coaching side of poker it, you hear a lot of players that are that are uh not super well versed as well as you hear people who are like playing a lot they'll see you like bet half pot on a flop or they'll watch like an old school pro bet half pot on the flop and like this guy sucks like what's he doing and like like you're saying with floppy V's, the floppy V is never going to freaking matter. It's, it's, it's never going to really matter. I can build my strategy on every single board, only playing half pot. And if I'm just a better poker player than they are, I'm probably just going to gain way more EV, right? Mm-hmm. Um, than they will playing like a bet 25, bet 70, bet 120 or something like that. So, so yeah, I think the flop sizes just don't matter. It's, it's really just about what strategy you want to play and what strategy you feel comfortable implementing uh, and then approaching turns and rivers based on how you're playing the flops right i want to mess i want to talk about a a bit of a subtle leak that you're referencing that i see very very commonly in almost all well a huge percentage of players that doesn't really have it has everything to do with poker but also about about judgment in general but basically i mean i see it in mixed games a lot uh where people look at this thing and they know it's incorrect and i i mean i've done it a bit too i'm not as bad with it i think because i've identified it but they look at something that is technically incorrect and they say, oh, this player must be bad because, as you said, they got the, the flop sizing a little bit wrong or whatever. But if you actually, first of all, in the actual case, if you actually look at the change in EV of the flop sizes between you know 30% and 50% in a lot of spots, I thought there was going to be a small difference. And then when I looked, it was like a really small difference. In fact, you could make a lot of sizes work, matter of fact if you just like work them reasonably well and adjust it properly to your opponents or whatever, as it turns out, um, at least, and you wouldn't be giving out much EV from at least the few tests I ran. But the uh, error that I see is that people are not really, they're only looking at the fact that someone got something wrong. They might even think that someone did something, they might even see that they did something stupid, like really like stupid and wrong but they don't factor in how frequently, for one thing, this thing is, or the EV of how this one thing shows up. And it, it, they would like see in mix, they would see like some stupid bet that makes no goddamn sense in Raz, and then say, oh my God, this guy's such an idiot, he must be so bad because he made this stupid bet in Raz. But that's not really how, like, that doesn't really tell you a whole lot about their whole theme of their game necessarily without going into further detail um and this would lead to this definitely led to a lot of especially mixed battle wars that were just very stupid and this is like one of the reasons why people do not um uh i mean i imagine this happens in tournaments too but they engage in battles that uh they they shouldn't i I mean i'm sure i've done this as well like it's hard not to uh and not to overestimate over under or i mean it's also hard to like under to to know your like exact frequencies of like doing certain things as well so there's that but uh it's important to like judge properly you can say with fine detail dude i mean i i think that what you just said is like is like one of the biggest 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 leaks that people have because and i had it too right you're saying you had like i think that almost everybody goes through it but you have to iterate past it so fast once you identify it because I made like kind of a pact last year where I was like, I will, n- I'm never talking poker with people that are constantly just like shitting on other people or like talking shit about these guys, especially good players. Right. I mean like 
they'll watch like one of the guys who's just made millions and millions of dollars in poker. He has houses all over the world. He's traveled the world for the past 20 years and he'll do one thing and he's like, yeah, he's lost it. He just sucks. You know, it's like, what do you mean? The guy, like, like, it's just so irrational to like make these judgments so quickly. And it's, it's such a better place, I think. And I feel so happy that, that I got to the better place where it's like every single time I'm surprised by a play, I just write it down and I try to figure out why they did it or why they're doing it. Was it a, was it actually a mistake or was it a true decision that they're just like, okay, well I wanted to check back the turn because like, like here's a great one. You know, this Jesse Lonis, right? Do you know this guy? No. He's he's a young American guy. He's maybe like 25 years old and he's just like won a ton the last like three years. And he's not a solver guy. He, He doesn't study much. Um, he, he, he's played a lot of poker, he started like limit hold him. And, and I like the guy a lot. He like completely <laughs> my life in a 25K in Florida a couple years ago, where I don't remember the exact board, but let's just say it was like 10, six, three, two spades. And I had ace five of spades and we're like 60 big blinds deep and he bets small. And it's like, okay, well, whatever. My, my wheel cards with the spade draws, they're like very likely to raise at, at a pretty good frequency. Uh, so I raise and he just like snap rips in my face for like 60 big or something like that. And I'm just like, all right, I have to like fold out all this equity now. And he just had queen 10 offsuit. You know, he had just like some like kind of marginal top pair and just like completely took like, like ruined my equity. And, uh, I remember thinking about the spot because other people at the table were like, dude, he just like sucks. Like, you know, not that they were saying it at the table, but you know what I mean? Like people see unique strategies and they're just like, oh, this guy sucks. And I'm just thinking to myself, like, dude, he just made me fold a lot of equity in a in a kind of a big hand in the 25k. Like, I mean, it, it can't be that bad, right? Like, like he did something good, right? Uh, yeah, I think that, that that was a hand that kind of opened my eyes. And and there's a lot of guys now that that aren't solver guys that do quite well, and everyone wants to just be like, oh, they suck, they suck, or whatever. It's like there's a lot of other skills than how you can play a bot. Like, there's so many other skills that that give you ROI in tournaments, um, and, and, and it's not related as much. Thank you.